Hey, Deserving Listeners, it's just me today. I thought I would answer a bunch of interesting emails about attachment. This first email is from upper tier patron Heather from New England. She says, could you talk a bit about reactive attachment disorder? My cousin is 18 and adopted and is diagnosed with reactive attachment disorder. Her behavior and emotional struggle struggles are many and severe. Will this condition ever be able to be controlled? End of email. Okay, so let's look into reactive attachment disorder. And I, I thought I'd also go into its companion disorder in the DSM-5 disinhibited social engagement disorder as well. Uh, so let me just talk about those. And um, if you want more detail on this, listen to my attachment deep dive, which is available to patrons only. Okay, DSM-5, reaction, reactive attachment disorder. Basically, someone with uh, someone diagnosed with reactive attachment disorder would probably also be observed to be disorganized attachment, if you're familiar. Uh, could be extreme avoidant, but usually disorganized. Reactive attachment disorder, uh, the symptoms are failure to seek comfort. They avoid eye contact. You know, these are children. So that the child will um, just never reach out to caregivers. They, they don't have a lot of eye contact. Frozen watchfulness is described, meaning that they seem like they're remaining very still, but they're hypervigilant at the same time. They will have unpredictable reunion responses, meaning that when the child is reunited with their caregivers, the behavior from the child will be unpredictable in that the child will sometimes celebrate the reunion, sometimes be terrified, sometimes ignore. Um, but essentially, the, the DSM-5 doesn't really describe reactive attachment disorder very well. Uh, so let me describe it in its, in a, in its essence. Um, these children, for very logical reasons of abuse and neglect, are terrified of caregivers and avoid attachments. They don't trust caregivers, and they seem they can seem completely detached. And often it's a result of massive attachment disruption that can occur during adoption. If you're adopted very close to birth, then you, you'll probably, um, in all, if your adoptive parents are, um, you know, attuned enough, then you'll probably be okay. But for a lot of adopted kids, they were either in, in an institution or moved around from foster care to foster care or something or completely neglected by their uh, biological parents. And that's why the child was taken away from them. And these early months, um, you know, six months, usually we're starting to think about um, children past four months, maybe six months. That's when they start to discriminate between adults. Um, uh, a one month old has trouble distinguishing between different caregivers. Um, it's not entirely true, but uh, the research shows that particularly once a kid and observation shows that when when children reach four to six months, they really start to say, OK, you are my caregiver and everyone else is actually not. And thus. I prefer to be with you and I don't want to be with other people. I might be curious about other people, but I'm really attaching to you. And then that persists, you know, for the rest of your life, really. Um, if things go well, you're attached to your parents for the rest of your life, your caregivers. And if you don't have those uh, experiences of a consistent attachment figure during those months, it neurologically and uh, personality wise will affect the child in some pretty negative ways. With reactive attachment disorder, often the child has not only been uh, neglected, but also abused. And so, you know, you've heard me talk about disorganized attachment disorder, a disorganized attachment style. And this is a style of attaching that is in reaction to abuse from your caregivers. Your caregiver is both the person you want to run to when you're scared and the caregiver is the source of the fear. So it causes the child to kind of have a, um, you know, a, 
a damned if you do, damned if you don't. You you want to run away from the scary monster, but the monster is what you want to run to because they're your attachment figure. So a reactive attachment disorder can develop. And um, and so that the child is, uh, anyway, so that's reactive attachment disorder. Now, this is pretty rare. Uh, disorganized attachment is a much broader um, criteria set in that uh, research will show that people, children and adults are anywhere between three to 5%, maybe more of the population will be categorized as having disorganized attachment. Whereas reactive attachment is less than 1% of children. And it can only be applied to children um, by definition, which is kind of interesting. You, you would think that we would have um, designations for adults, but usually what these kinds of disorders will change into is personality disorders, right? Like borderline narcissism, this kind of thing. So just to give you an idea, you know, um, less than 1% have, of children have been found to suffer from reactive attachment disorder. Uh, usually what we're talking about are those rare children who go through extremely difficult first couple years of their lives. However, reactive attachment disorder has a high prevalence among children with attachment loss, like as in adoption or when you're in a, in a you know, a, a, an orphan institution of some kind. Uh, and the prevalence with this population can be as high as 50%. So for those children with attachment loss, it can be as high as 50%. Um, and, you know, how their categories and attachment loss is significant attachment loss. It's not like divorce, usually that kind of, it's usually like your parents die when you're a year and a half old or you have no caregivers from zero to two. All right, so now let's talk about disinhibited social engagement disorder. This is someone who is um, indiscriminately friendly. They seek comfort from strangers. They are uh, can be demanding to caregivers, like look at me, pay attention to me. They can have a fair amount of attention-seeking behavior. They will... Um, not care about unfamiliar settings. They might cuddle with strangers. They might ask a lot of personal questions of strangers. They might invade social boundaries often. So this is the description, but essentially what disinhibited social engagement disorder is, is that the child has learned to be constantly seeking attachment security because they haven't received enough of it or it's, it's too inconsistent. And so they're constantly desperate for attachment security and will seek it from everyone, even strangers. Um, again, this is pretty rare that what, when we apply disinhibited social engagement disorder, we're really talking about an extreme end of attachment insecurity. Again, less than 1% of children will suffer from this according to research, but those with attachment loss, significant attachment loss, it couldn't be as high as 50% of those children will suffer from disinhibited social engagement disorder. I've treated children with this disorder and session one, minute five, they are cuddling with me and sitting in my lap or um, a lot of seeking attention for me, which can be very in endearing uh, because as a therapist with children, it, it was always um, a goal of mine to bond with the, with all my clients, including the children. But it was also eerie because they seemed to almost be in love with me, you know, like right away. So obviously we can see um, uh, how this could develop into disorganized attachment, um, but most likely extreme preoccupied attachment, right? that adults with preoccupied attachment can uh, bond very quickly out of desperation. They can be attention-seeking, demanding due to attachment disruption early in life. So, but really disinhibited social engagement disorder as a child can develop into any of the insecure attachments. It could be avoidant, disorganized, preoccupied, but again, most likely uh, preoccupied. 
So again, just to review, you have reactive attachment disorder, which is more like disorganized, an extreme version of disorganized. And then you have disinhibited social engagement disorder, which is more like preoccupied in, in a child. Um, then we have what sometimes gets thrown around anecdotally. I will hear the, the term attachment disorder. Someone will just say that person has an attachment disorder. This is a vague term for various different things. They could be referring, you know, when people are clinicians are saying attachment disorder, they could be talking about reactive attachment or they could be talking about disseminated social engagement. But they also could just be talking about behaviors in children related to attachment disruption, like, I don't know, acting out at school or something. They also could just be talking about attachment insecurity, um, avoidant, preoccupied, disorganized. So whenever I hear attachment disorder, I'm always like, what do you mean by that? Um, it, it, and it kind of bothers me because we have much more precise language and research. Okay, so that's reactive attachment disorder and distributed to social engagement disorder. Let's get back to your questions. Up to your patron, Heather from New England, you say, um, my cousin, 18 and adopted, is diagnosed with reactive attachment disorder. Her behavior and emotional struggles are many and severe. Will this condition ever be able to be controlled? End of email. Um, so I have worked with a lot of, in my early career, particularly teenagers with attachment disorders such as reactive attachment disorder. And it, the, the, a very common um, story uh, was that I, I would be called sometimes into the home to provide family therapy for a teenager, maybe around 14 usually was when the crap would hit the fan. And uh, the parents would tell me that the child is completely out of control smoking pot, not going to school, stealing from them, you know, just rifling through their purse and taking money, um, staying out all night, maybe even making threats. And the, uh, so they, you know, they're very concerned and they would, you know, maybe even get um, the law involved. And then they would call me and, and I'd go into the house and I would find that the child was adopted into the family and had either been extremely neglected and abused before the age of two consistently or was in an orphan institution before the, you know, up until, you know, six to 12 months, maybe even longer, and reportedly probably didn't have a consistent uh, caregiver. at Because you can be in an or orphan institution, and as long as you have a consistent caregiver, uh, it, it will mitigate this attachment disruption. It'll still be horrible when the infant is separated from that single caregiver. But at the very least, the child during those critical months develops a little bit of attachment security. Whereas a lot of these orphan institutions, they just don't, they don't know, or they don't have the money or they don't care. And these children just get passed around from caregiver to caregiver, which in the first few months is fine. But uh, attachment neurologically wise, it's critical that children have a small set of caregivers that uh, they see consistently um, past, you know, age month, four months, six months, this kind of thing. Anyway, so I would find that the child was either an orf was in an orphan institution, sometimes in um, Eastern Europe or in Korea or China sometimes. Um, for whatever reason, in Seattle, there were a fair amount of adoptees from those regions. Um, or the child had parents who were drug addicted and had a lot of troubles with that early in life. And then maybe an, um, an aunt adopted the child. And things, uh, the parents would report that the child early in the child's life would be uh, distant and disengaged, um, would sometimes be lovely children, you know, at the age of six, seven, eight years old, they could be very caring, very, you know, it's not like they're psychopaths. Um, some of them were psychopaths, by the way, I, I actually, um, did treat, you know, kids that we would characterize as conduct disorder, but definitely had psychopathic traits that seemed likely to persist into adulthood, which was scary for everyone, including me. Uh, so you, you can develop psychopathy, any social personality disorder in this um, situation, even sadism. 
So that would happen, but it, it, it was rare, but you know, less rare than kids who don't have this background. Most often what I would find is that they would report, and sometimes I would come to homes with kids that were seven and they were already having issues. But anyway, point is, is that um, the crap would hit the fan at 14, but the parents would tell me that at you know age five to 10, the kids seemed okay, uh, although distant. They would find that they, they would struggle to bond with the child. The child didn't seem to really connect with other people, didn't seem to really care. You know, the way uh, most kids, uh, when they're uh, attuned to, and they're um, neurotypical, I guess I should include. Well, I shouldn't say that. Um, most kids, regardless of neurotypicalness or, or not, uh, really are interested in other kids, right? They're, they're very interested in their friends. They want to have fun. You know, when they meet other kids, they, they just glom onto them and let's play and let's dance and let's run around the house. And, you know, whereas kids with these major attachment disruptions early in life, they, they, they didn't seem to care as much and they seem to kind of be in their own world and different labels would be thrown around like uh, possible autism or depression or something like that. And uh, maybe even those or ADHD, very commonly mislabeled to these individuals. Now, these kids could have autism, they could have ADHD, but I would find that the system was much more likely to throw around those terms uh, for whatever reason, uh, rather than looking at the attachment disruption as the problem and, and the condition. You know, you can have a kid who's in school who isn't really paying a lot of attention. And you're like, oh, they're so distracted. They, they don't do their homework, and the, uh, you know, they look at all the symptoms and of ADHD, and they're like, oh, obviously the kid has ADHD. Well, in fact, what was happening with some of these kids was that they just didn't care about the teachers. You know, another thing about seven through twelve year olds is usually they really love their teachers optimally they they love their teachers and they want to please the teacher and so they will do homework based on that uh, connection and and wanting to get approval whereas the attachment disruption disrupted children they just don't really care they're not they're not really paying attention to that because they neurologically didn't develop that pathway of seeing other caregivers or people as important you know, there, there's a critical window that children need to experience so that they connect their emotions and their needs and their attention on other human beings. And if that is passed by, then the child just neurologically just doesn't really care. And th this was really difficult for parents to understand. And and I only learned this through experience. You know, I no one taught me this, by the way. I. Uh, you know, these families would get referred to me. And in the beginning of my career, I got referred a lot of Korean kids that were adopted into white families in the Seattle area because I was one of the one of the only Asian therapists that anyone knew. And so they just thought, well, throw Kirk into the mix with these Korean kids because maybe, you know, Kirk will be able to, uh, so we're just use my name in the third person, um, will be able to uh, connect with these um, Korean kids, which, you know, it's kind of a funny thing, <laughs> but, and you know, half of them were boys. So maybe it's like, well, get an Asian male therapist. But anyway, so I got a lot of these Korean kids who were adopted, South Korean kids who were adopted into white families. And so many of them had this issue, not all of them, for sure. Some of them were adopted early enough that they weren't, um, a product of this um, attachment disruption, but, but, um, so anyway, wh where was I? The teenage behaviors would be very out of control, and so these kids, you know, I, I worked with a lot of teenagers with behavior problems. The kids with attachment disruption early in life would just be completely out of control. I mean, because they just didn't care. They didn't care about you or your feelings. They. They might not be sadistic. They might not be psychopathic. They just didn't connect. And when you as a parent, you know, uh, 
people, and I learned this the hard way too, that uh, through experience, that uh, children don't follow the rules primarily because of the structure. That's usually what everyone, you got to have good structure. You got to have good consequences. You got to follow through. No, <laughs> that is not my experience. My experience is children follow rules because they're desperate for your approval and they're desperate not to get your disapproval. And that depends on a foundation of a bond between you and your authority figure, whether it's a caregiver or a teacher or something. And when you don't feel there's a connection and or you just don't even really pay attention to those uh, authority figures, caregivers, teachers, then you just don't really care about following the rules. And these kids would do that. So, you know, I learned this the hard way because so many people in my field talk about structure. They're always like, okay, you got a kid that's breaking the rules. You got to have better structure. You got to have consistency. And I find that eventually it kind of became a way of blaming the victim because, you know, these parents, adoptive parents would be victimized by these children uh, sometimes, or at the very least they're, you know, they're trying hard and they're at their wits end. And these kids would be out of control, not because of the parents' bad parenting skills, but just because the kid had a, you could almost consider it a neuro difference uh, that just makes this life a completely different sort of life. And so there'd just be this effort of just like constantly trying to get the parents to have this extremely buttoned up parenting approach and it would never work. And then I would go next door to treat another family and the kid didn't have an attachment disruption and the parents would have very little consistency and yet the kid followed the rules. So I'm like, okay, what's going on here? You know, cause there are parents out there who are, are, you know, in terms of consistency, in terms of consequences, in terms of following through and in terms of having a sensible discipline system, there are parents out there who, who really aren't doing well, but the kids are doing fine. Why? Because the kid doesn't want disapproval from the parents. They, they love their parents, feel connected to them and don't want disapproval. So there's this obsession in, in my field about consistency. And, and so I try to, I try to, um, beat that out of my trainee sometimes like stop you know it's fine consistency is good right you know and certainly that can be a factor but really what we're trying to hope for is a strong bond between parents and children such that the child just naturally wants to appease you know as a analogy or a similar situation uh, I don't follow my wife's requests you could consider those rules because she punishes me in a consistent way or rewards me in a consistent way. It's because I love her and I don't want her to be upset one. And two, I don't want her to be upset at me. Right. I, I don't, I don't need my wife to uh, give me rewards and consequences in this consistent way in order to modify my behavior. I, I just don't want her to be upset <laughs> at anyone, let alone me. So, and children aren't different human beings than adults. They're, they're humans. And so uh, now again, again, c consistency uh, can, if, if you're wildly inconsistent, that can certainly screw things up. But like I said, I've seen some really inconsistent parents have, you know, angels for children because the bond is good anyway. Um, now, this isn't to say that you don't have discipline. You should probably have some discipline. You know, you should probably have some limits. Uh, kids without any limits grow up with weird schemas that cause all sorts of personality problems and, and social problems. But anyway, um, so where was I? Yeah, so I would see the kid 14 and they would just be completely off the chain in terms of their behavior. Is that, a, is that do people still say that <laughs> from 20 years ago? Off the chain. Um, anyway, so... Um, these people would have reactive attachment disorder. Um, um, and then that would morph into conduct disorder. Anyway, so you're asking, sorry, I just punched the microphone. Uh, you're saying Heather, that your cousin, 18 adoptive, di adopted, diagnosed with reactive attachment disorder, her behavior and emotional struggles, struggles are many and severe. So you know, another thing is drug abuse. And um, sexualized behavior can also be a problem. And then you're saying, Heather, will this condition ever be controlled? The answer is no. I mean, you can do your best and there are things you can do to mitigate the, the problems. And, and I would work with uh, parents on different approaches. But a lot of it was just 
saying, look, uh, the ship has sailed regarding attachment um, neurology. You know, the, the brain has skipped that phase. And so there's no way to go back. And you can do your best. You can you can try to build that connection through secure attachment. Uh, but it something that at the age of uh, six to 18 months, that takes a year of neurodevelopment. To try to do that when the kid is 14 could take 25 years of work or maybe even longer. So um, it you can start that when you're 14, but you're not going to get uh, the job done uh, even by the time the kid moves out of the house. So a lot of it for me was helping parents lower their expectations. But it was really hard for parents to do that because a, a lot of adoptive parents are very loving, caring people, and they do not want to give up. And it feels like giving up when it's not giving up. Uh, I would, it would, I, they would say, it kind of feels like I'm giving up or you're, I'm just supposed to, you know, let, let it go and let this kid be this way. And I would say, you don't have any choice. Uh, you could, it, it, you could say, I'm not going to give up, but the reality of your child's brain is going to be the same. So you can either accept that and incorporate that into your expectations and your approach, or you can continue to, you know, slam your head against the wall and uh, harm yourself, but also harm your marriage and harm the child. Because the more you are frustrated with the child, the further back we are regarding attachment security that the child needs to, you know, slowly start building back. So you ask, you know, will this, will this condition ever be controlled? Uh, like I said, the answer is no. Um, now the kids do grow up and they don't usually stay in that rebellious behavioral phase past, you know, maybe even 17 or, you know, at least by 20, uh, maybe, you know, maybe a little older, the child will have grown out of that phase. Now they still have attachment issues, but they're much more, um, functional as a human being you know they might smoke pot but they don't deal pot they might um, have a job that doesn't require a lot of human interaction they might struggle with relationships but have relationships they might struggle with parenting but it's not horrible so you know that's that's what i've seen now, for some of you out there, you might actually be one of these kids with attachment disruptions early in life and maybe even were diagnosed with disinhibited or reactive attachment disorder when you were young. And uh, you're not doomed. <laughs> you know, uh, the, uh, you might have been doomed at 14 to be problematic in your behavior, but as an adult, uh, one can get your needs met, one can heal. Uh, Bob, I, I don't think he would have qualified for reactive attachment or disinhibited as a child, but he definitely was abused by his parent, by his father, and developed disorganized attachment and is a wonderful, functional human being and has a beautiful, wonderful marriage and is a very caring therapist and has gone to therapy for decades and has healed. So uh, there are absolutely ways of moving forward in a way that you can build a relatively happy life. All right, let's take a break. Hey, Deserving Listeners. As you all know, I am constantly recommending that people go to therapy. We all need therapy from time to time. Well, one of the options available that is definitely worth checking out is BetterHelp. If you're looking for a therapist, I would give it a try by going to betterhelp.com slash Kirk. Make sure you use the promo code Kirk because you get 10% off your first month and it really helps us out. As you watch these videos, I know many of you have been motivated to find your own therapist, which is great because you deserve it. And I know also that it can be hard to find a good fit, find the right one for you. Well, one of the options available in terms of your shopping is to go to betterhelp.com slash Kirk. I've been told you can start communicating with your therapist in under 24 hours. You can message your counselor at any time. Plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions. I've also been told that it's often less expensive than in-person therapy, and you should know that this service is available to clients worldwide. So go to betterhelp.com slash Kirk to get 10% off your first month today.
All right, we're back from the break. This next email is from patron Jackie. She says, I'm curious about disinhibited social engagement disorder. Do you know of any current research being done on this topic? I have searched through the peer reviewed literature and there doesn't seem to be much information on disinhibited social engagement disorder in general. Additionally, there doesn't seem to be any studies on adults with disinhibited. I suspect that I may have had disinhibited social engagement disorder as a child due to massive attachment disruptions in the first two years of life. I had many caregivers in foster care. I was kidnapped. I was neglected and abused. I had basic needs that weren't being met, etc. I displayed all of the disinhibited social engagement disorder sy symptoms listed in the DSM-5, such as actively approaching and interacting with unfamiliar adults, overly familiar behavior, wandering off in familiar settings without checking with a caregiver, willingness to leave, to leave with strangers. This theme of disinhib disin disinhibition, particularly with strangers, has been a persi persistent feature of my interactions throughout my life and led to further abuse as both a teen and young adult. Thankfully, by establishing secure attachments with my adoptive parents, friends, and spouse, plus years of trauma-informed therapy and EMDR, the disinhibited social engagement disorder symptoms have resolved. Inter interestingly, this resolution did not happen until my mid-20s. I had a cognitive behavioral therapist since the age of 13, but made no progress until I worked with a clinician who specialized in preverbal trauma and EMDR. Previous therapists had disregarded the impact of early trauma altogether and did not seem to understand that my struggles were predominantly relational as a child. I'm curious if it is common practice for clinicians to screen clients for attachment trauma or foster or adoption trauma before making a diagnosis? If so, how do most clinicians amend their treatment strategies for clients with that kind of history? As a person who spent more than a decade spinning her wheels in treatment with several misdiagnoses, I can, t I can say that I wholeheartedly appreciate the clinicians who finally saw me and helped me heal from my attachment wounds. End of email. Well, first off, Jackie, I'm so glad that you were able to heal and that your symptoms have resolved. That is wonderful. And you worked very hard in therapy and you never gave up. And that is uh, inspirational, truly. Uh, the second thing I'll say is I'm sorry you went through this. This, you know, in terms of being misdiagnosed and not treated uh, appropriately in in therapy, this is very common. It's actually uh, rare that you manage to find the right person. Uh, most clinicians don't understand this stuff, and if they do understand it, they don't know how to treat it. And I, on one hand, I think it's getting better because I think there is more awareness of attachment and. Um, relational traumas or trauma in general. But on the other hand, it's also getting worse because there's more and more cognitive behavioral therapy people and there's more and more quote unquote evidence-based practice uh, push, you know, pushed on students and on clinicians. And without going into all the details, it's absolutely evidence-based practice to use attachment-based therapies and trauma therapies with people who have attachment disorders as, as an adult and have behaviors from that. Um, but you know, you, you asked some pretty good questions. Um, you asked, do you know of any current research being done on disinhibited social engagement disorder? And you say, I, I, I've searched through peer reviewed literature and there doesn't seem to be much information on disinhibited social engagement disorder in general. Um, yeah, there's tons of, of uh, research on disinhibited. In fact, um, just typing this into my, um, my uh, research database here, uh, there's so many articles. Um, how many articles? <laughs> Several pages, but uh, we have self-esteem in adolescence with reactive attachment disorder or disinhibited social engagement disorder. We have meta-analyses of the associations between disinhibited social engagement disorder behaviors and child attachment insecurity or disorganization. We have disinhibited social engagement behaviors in, lung, in young mal, maltreated children. 
We have reactive attachment disorder and disinhibited social engagement disorder in adolescents, co-occurring psychopathology, psycho psychosocial problems. Now, I will say that in re relation to another question you had, most of this is focused on children and teenagers and not a lot of adults. Um, I think there's a lot of problems with that. One, uh, a lot of reasons for that. I think one is that uh, we have a different language system for adults that's more related to uh, personality disorders. And so, uh, and we tend to bifurcate children and teens from adults, even though they're all human beings and development needs to consider all phases of life. So, you know, there will be researchers and uh, clinicians and even institutions that focus on children and never treat adults which was always kind of weird to me. Um, and for me, uh, I had to discover this stuff on my own. No one taught me this stuff. Um, I early, when I was getting my first master's in the mid nineties, I was exposed to a number of different theories, uh, including cognitive behavioral theory and was attracted to object relations, family therapy, because it involved, uh, uh, early development, and a version of attachment essentially but i didn't know about attachment theory or i'd barely heard of it um and so object i was you know getting a degree in family therapy and there were a number of different theories that i was exposed to systems theory milan mri uh, satir bowen whitaker symbolic experiential solution focused narrative these kinds of things but object relations family therapy really piqued my interest. I, I barely understood it. Um, well, I didn't understand it. I barely grasped some of the things. And then later, post-grad, I was uh, attracted to psychodynamic theory in general, not just the family therapy aspect of it. And then years and years later, probably 15 years later, I eventually uh, found out about interpersonal theory and intersubjective and that led me down this road of projective identification. And then eventually I got to attachment and slowly over time, I began to see the world through the attachment theory lens. Doing the deep dive, for example, really furthered that. But for a long time, I thought attachment theory was an adjunct to interpersonal psychodynamic ther therapy. But the more and more I, uh, live and think about it, or at least this phase of my life, the more I'm just like, man, attachment theory explains almost everything, <laughs> especially if you kind of expand the language a little bit. And um, no one taught me that. I didn't have any mentor along these lines. I mean, attachment theory explains systems theory to me. Uh, and without attachment theory, systems theory, family systems theory doesn't make any sense. Like why would a system organize itself other than to attach, right? So um, to get that need met. And, um, and, and, that, and so I just summarized 25 years of uh, personal career development, and that's where I've come to. There wasn't a single professor that said, let me teach you attachment theory and how uh, transformative it was. Now, there are teachers out there that are like that, but um, I never met one, and I have two masters and a doctorate. So uh, I've, I've been in a lot of graduate school classes, you know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? So um, now, uh, yeah, what was the other question you had here? I'm curious if it's common practice. Yeah, um, yeah, so many, my, my point here is so many clinicians are unaware of what attachment disruptions can do because it's so much more complicated, right? Uh, if you came in to therapy and you were depressed, then they're like, okay, CBT, let's, let's work on your uh, sleep, let's work on your self-talk, let's work on getting you support, let's maybe put you on meds. And you might actually address the depression a little bit at that point. But unbeknownst to the clinician, what really is underneath the depression, causing the depression, is a lifetime of attachment disruptions and, and a lifetime of never getting your attachment needs met. And this form of therapy can actually kind of perpetuate it because the client is like, you know, just presenting all of this attachment need to the therapist and, you know, trying to bond with the therapist, but the CBT therapist is pushing back on that and saying boundaries, boundaries, boundaries. 
And so this can even, dare I say, uh, traumatize the client even further. Um, it can also be kind of like a version of gaslighting because now I, I want to be clear. I use cognitive therapy all the time. I use behavioral therapy all the time. But when we uh, look at the, um, you know, the practice and the teaching of cognitive behavioral therapy in our field, it, it can ignore some fundamental human needs that need to be addressed in therapy. Anyway, so when you are suffering from a global personality attachment problems and you go to a CBT therapist and they, and they keep telling you essentially, you know, different words they'll use, but essentially this is a problem with the way you think you, you are interpreting things in a way that is making you depressed. You're interpreting things in a way that is making you um, think that you're alone or whatever. Um, you're causing problems in your life by you know, committing these behaviors. You're not having enough rewards in your life for behavior that will be more functional. This isn't on purpose, but it can have an effect that the client says, oh, I'm to blame. You know, I don't think right. I don't behave right. I don't have the right system in place. I don't have the right coping skills in place. And, you know, coping skills and thoughts, patterns, and cognitions are great to focus on and very helpful, but um, aren't going to cure the attachment wound. <laughs> you know, they are, uh, aren't going to rewire the brain to believe that one can trust other people. So uh, uh, this happens all the time. And what I would wish is that CBT therapists understand how great their, ther their therapy is, which they deserve to have, and what the limitations are and when they should refer, or at least have another therapist involved. Someone who has attachment disorders as an adult can be treated well by someone with CBT, but they, they would need another therapist to do what you experienced, Jackie, which is this pre-verbal trauma therapy and EMDR. Anyway, let's go on to another email. All right, this next email is from anonymous upper tier patron. She writes, I have been listening to the attachment deep dives and they are brilliant. They have got me thinking about my own parenting. My son's biological father and I split before he was a year old. When I started dating, my ex-husband became abusive and eventually abandoned my son completely. My son is now 10 years old and hasn't seen or spoken to his biological father since he was two. The parent, the, the person I had just begun dating at that point acted as a huge support for me during that time, and my son started calling him dad. To this day, we are married, and my son still acknowledges my husband as his father and vice versa. My questions are, does my child still have a major attachment injury from his father leaving between 18 months and two years old? Uh, and or end of that, uh, chiming in here, uh, probably an injury. Yeah. You know, he, as a young boy, although he doesn't remember, uh, in all likelihood did bond with his father um, up until the age of two years old. And to have his father just abandon him is probably going to cause some issue there. Uh, you're asking, is it a major attachment injury? Uh, it's unknown. If it was, you'd probably see some behaviors at this point. And given the scenario that you laid out, uh, in my experience, that doesn't constitute a major attachment injury, but it can. Yeah, you just don't know how kids are going to react to that. These kinds of disruptions, attachment-wise, of which there absolutely was one, can be mitigated by attunement from you and his stepdad, which sounds like you did a lot there. But there's likely an injury to working models of self and other, meaning that his working model of self could have developed this pre-verbal notion that he isn't worthy of, of attunement or worthy of non-abandonment or that he is worthy of being abandoned and or working model of others that they will just suddenly disappear and that he either has to develop some avoidant tendencies or some preoccupied tendencies. But I don't know. Um, 
there's he, he could be he could exhibit no behaviors that could be conceptualized by this, but I'd be surprised. Um, you also ask, do you think my child's relationship with my husband could be as secure as with a biological father from an attachment theory standpoint? End of question. Absolutely. Uh, one can develop security at any age. You don't need to be by bi biological parent. You don't need to be there from the start. But, but, you know, he was almost there from the start, from the age of two. That's, that's pretty early on. So um, absolutely a child can develop a secure attachment with your husband that can be um, just as deep as if your husband was there from the beginning. Your last question is, and what can I do to help my son's possible attachment injury? Well, you're already probably doing everything that you should be doing, which is attuning to your child, caring about your child, um, having a stable family life, having, a, uh, having another parent that is stable and good for him. But I would watch for these working model issues um, and if he's interested, uh, particularly as a teenager going to therapy, particularly as an adult, it, it's likely that when he starts to date the, or, um, you know, have romantic relationships of which he might not ever have depending on his, uh, situation, but, um, he will likely have, he'll, he'll, he'll likely exhibit some behaviors. It's not uncommon for kids with attachment disruptions of this category, uh, of which there's a lot of kids with these kinds of attachments. I mean, because even if you just have a divorce where the parent doesn't abandon the child, there might be very limited contact with one of the parents, and that can absolutely feel like a, um, you know, abandonment to some extent. Anyway, so these kinds of things happen, and it's not uncommon for the kid with the injury to not exhibit any outward signs of it, between the ages of you know five and twelve, you know Freud called this the latent period, I believe, because there's just not a lot that happens. You know, kids are um, fairly uncomplicated at this point. They're focused on what's happening in the here and now. Um, they uh, are fairly easygoing, usually not always for sure, but it's not uncommon to have something wonky happen at the age of thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, or even twenty-five. And to say, you know, he was fine from five to 12. And then all of a sudden, boom, this thing happened. So, you know, it, you're just going to have to um, uh, wade yourself, wade through that when it happens. Um, but the key is that you attune so that whatever attachment injury he experienced can be um, eclipsed by new evidence that he is a good person and worthy of love and security and loyalty and that you and your husband can be depended on that you are attuned you're there you notice him you react well and that you can be a secure base to which he can return you're already doing that and your husband is doing that so just you know maybe all you need to do is just stay you know stay on track with that all right, this next email is from Upper Tier Patron and fellow Hapa Trish. She says, can neurodivergent people, such as those who suffer from ADHD, truly have secure attachment? I just listened to all six chapters of your attachment style deep dives and could not help but to feel that so many of the symptoms of having an insecure attachment, they overlap with symptoms of ADHD. For example, issues with memory and emotional regulation. I imagine that a lot of disorders have had symptoms that overlap with insecure attachment, like having low levels of differentiation. Although seeing how ADHD is likely genetic in nature and has to do with neurodivergence, it seems like we are just destined to have insecure attachment. In other words, if ADHD cannot be cured and ADHD symptoms resemble insecure attachment, can someone with ADHD even be securely attached? Thanks. And I love hyper focusing on your podcast for hours every day. It's currently my favorite procrastination tool. End of email. Well, first off, fellow Hapa and upper tier patron Trish, uh, stop procrastinating because you need to represent us Hapa as well. Uh, just joking. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So ADHD can do two things. One, 
it can absolutely resemble attachment insecurity, as you're saying, uh, in that it, you know, people with ADHD are notoriously distracted, which can look like avoidant, or they can have memory problems, which is also um, like avoidant. You can have a lot of emotional dysregulation from ADHD, which can look like preoccupied. So um, I, I wouldn't say they overlap. I would say that people can mistake ADHD for insecure attachment or insecure attachment with ADHD. So there's some misdiagnosing there that can happen. But the second thing is, I think more importantly, which is that ADHD absolutely can cause attachment insecurity because ADHD um, with parents, they will have a hard time understanding what's happening in their kid and will think that the child is just being a bad kid. And so the parents will be frustrated, will be punishing, will be rejecting, and they will lower their attunement to the child and can make the child feel rejected. So uh, this experience uh, as a child from zero to 10, and you're being treated unfairly, you're, you're trying as a neurodivergent ADHD kid, but everything keeps failing and, and no one seems to care about you, or at least there's limited caring, then that's gonna cause attachment disruption, right? So uh, people with ADHD almost always have attachment insecurity stemming from lack of understanding or and or frustration in the, in the parents because they, they just don't know how to react to a kid who has ADHD because there isn't a lot of education or support out there. Now, there is, like here in Seattle, we have the Todaro, uh, Hollowell, Hollowell Todaro Center, which uh, specializes in that. And there are, you know, special centers around the world. But, um, but even then, you know, it's hard. You know, if you have a kid who has severe ADHD, it is frustrating. Um, and people who claim that like ADHD isn't a real thing or that, you know, it's just kids are going to be kids. Um, they've never seen actual ADHD. <laughs> like if you've, if you've seen a kid, uh, five, 10 years old, who actually has ADHD, um, you will not question the fact that ADHD exists or not. Now, are many kids... Uh, labeled with ADHD, even though they don't have it because they're just a little distracted or, you know, their family life isn't going very well or they're not challenged enough or they're gifted or they're anxious or some other. Yeah, absolutely. That happens. Um, but, you know, you, you ask an interesting question. You're like uh, ADHD symptoms are similar to insecure attachment symptoms. So therefore, uh, no one with ADHD can be securely attached. And um, no, uh, that's not how I see it. Um, if as a ADHD person, you have symptoms that are coinciding with insecure attachment, that doesn't mean you have insecure attachment, right? In the same way that someone can be anxious and have symptoms that coincide with ADHD, that doesn't mean you have ADHD. It just means you have ADHD like symptoms generating from your into generating from your uh, anxiety. So you can have attachment insecure like symptoms because of your ADHD, but you don't actually have insecure attachment, right? Um, so yeah, but I would find, and I don't know the research that mo most people with ADHD, especially the upper ranges, suffer from at least some insecure attachment. It, it happens all the time uh, to the point where ADHD people, in my experience, are much more likely to develop personality disorders, that kind of thing. So uh, on the flip side, if your uh, caregivers know about ADHD or you have a relatively um, you know, minor case of ADHD and you're attuned to well enough and you're made to feel like you're loved, you're made to feel safe, you're made to feel like you're a good person in spite of your distractibility and hyperactivity, um, then you absolutely, with ADHD, can develop secure attachment, 100%. All right, this next email is from anonymous patron. She writes, I just finished the epiphany provoking attachment theory deep dive. I grew up with a very avoidant, unattuned and possibly narcissistic father, and I have an extremely responsible and kind and selfless mother. My mother had endless energy for me and never put herself first. The issue, the issue for me was I learned that my mom was almost overly empathetic. 
When she learned of any struggles I had, she would lose sleep worrying on my behalf. So starting very young, I tried to act like I had my stuff together. I tried to make, I tried to make it look like things were easy and I didn't open much at all to my mom. I grew up to be an avoidant adult and wife. I have struggled secretly with a lot of issues. Is this a typical result of having a very selfless and empathetic and nervous parent? She is such an amazingly fun, energetic, and loving grandmother to my kids that I really question how I turned out so seemingly insecure and attached, insecurely attached. End of email. By the way, if you can uh, hear the congestion <laughs> in my face, um, I have I, I have some kind of virus. Um, I tested for COVID and I'm negative, um, and it's a very mild case of uh, of a virus but i just thought i (laughs) would acknowledge that i have to tell you when i first started so i i'll just go on this uh jag here so um a week and a half ago i started getting that feeling in your chest when you feel like you're starting to get sick and it's been so long since i've been sick because it had been a while even before the pandemic that i'd been sick that i was like is this what it felt like to be sick? And you know that it's a slight, I don't know, warmth in your lungs or something. I don't know how to describe it. Like a very slight rawness in your lungs. And, um, and it was just barely there. And I thought, man, you know, I'm, I'm health anxious. And so am I just making stuff up? Was it, I don't know, just not getting enough sleep or I don't, sometimes I, uh, cause I have allergies. I thought maybe it was that. And, um, and that lasted, you know, for a day and then it went away and then it sort of came back and I was like, am I feeling so? And then, um, one night I just, I I had some vertigo and I, it just suddenly hit me that maybe I have COVID and I had been, I went to a movie with Berto, if you saw the picture on Instagram, um, and there was hardly anyone there. And I, cause it was a reserve seating, um, theater. And I could tell that there was only like, I don't know, six other people in the, you know, it was a huge theater. And I bought seats for us that were um, far away from everyone else. And, you know, everyone's masked up. But I didn't wear my mask all the time because I was eating popcorn because I, I haven't had movie popcorn in like two years. And so I I think maybe that's where it happened um, because I don't, I don't do things that are going to put me at risk. But who knows? You know, I could have... Um, gotten whatever I have from a variety of things. You know, I'm, I'm pretty, I wash my hands all the time. Da, da, da. I mean, I'm, I, I, I was one of those people that would open the bathroom door with like my sleeve. Um, I've been doing that for decades. And so, um, the pandemic has made everyone like me essentially, but, um, so one night I just thought, Oh my God, I have COVID and I was freaking out and it was just terrifying. You know, you're looking up all these, long COVID thing. I'm, I'm fully vaxxed by the way, <laughs> but it's been a while, you know, I, since I'm a therapist, got my vaccine ages ago, you know what it's, it's October. Now I think I got, let's see, well, I have it in my wallet. Let's see, what did I exactly get it? Was it in March? Um, it was in, um, it was in March. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's been, seven months, you know, six, seven months and your immunity, you know, starts to decline over time. And I was like, Oh my God, you know, and, um, but I, I, I got the, you know, good test, not the sort of not so good test and test negative. Thank God. And this has all the hallmarks of just like a typical bug that is going around. And I've heard other people that will have non COVID and it, cause it could be a coronavirus, by the way, cause that's what the common cold is. Um, but it's mainly in my nose. If you can hear it <laughs> at this point, it's like 10 days later and it moved from my chest to my throat. And now it's like up in my, um, nasal passages. And so uh, i you know, it probably sounds like I'm like my nose is stuffed up and it kind of is, but uh, anyway, <laughs> so I just thought I should say, it. you know, normally I would just be like, yeah, I have a bug, but I feel like in today's world, I have to give the full story. Um, and I know some of you, 
saw me on, I went to a football game, um, I don't know, a month ago or something. And some people were concerned that I was, you know, in public. And even uh, that Seahawks game was very lightly attended. I, you know, people were masked up the whole time. You're outside. Um, we weren't sitting near anyone else, by the way. Um, I don't think I would want to go if I was like jammed up. Ne- In fact, I know I wouldn't want to go if I was jammed up next to a bunch of people, even if we were masked. I, I don't know. I just, I'm terrified of breakthrough cases and uh, for mainly for people around me. I'm fairly confident that since I'm fully vaxxed and I feel like my immune system is okay enough that um, I wouldn't die. And the statistics show that vaccinated people are, you know, much less likely to even be hospitalized, but I'm terrified for, uh, you know, my parents, my, uh, Stacy's parents and other kinds of people like that. So, um, but I'm also par- terrified for me, <laughs> no joke. And, um, getting this virus proves that, you know, someone infected me. Now I don't have a vaccine for whatever I contracted i do have a vaccine for the flu now and shingles and for um uh, coronavirus for sars cov2 and um several other things <laughs> anyway so anonymous patron oh in conclusion get your vaccine get your booster uh if you are in a echo chamber that says that the vaccine has a microchip or is going to kill you. Um, that is not demonstrated by observation. So, uh, you know, you're gonna, I, I like you, if you're listening right now, you are, I'm a fan of you and I don't want you to get hurt. And I, according to the science, 99% of the experts agree that you are far more safe taking the vaccine than not. Um, so, uh, uh, because I care about you, uh, please do that. And, um, yeah. All right. Anonymous patron. Uh, she, I read her email, right? (laughs) So she says, I finished the epiphany provoking attachment theory, deep dive. I grew up with a narcissistic father, but a very nice mom. Uh, my mom was also kind of nervous. I have attacked, I have avoided attachment. Um, why is this? Well, it's hard to say where your avoidant attachment came from. I would say there's two main possibilities. One is that your mom was attuned well enough and maybe a little nervous, but not in a destructive way. And your avoidant attachment developed in reaction to your father. You know, uh, just because you have a great mom that, that doesn't, um, protect you entirely from the attachment disruption of your father. The other possibility is that you reacted, you you developed avoidant uh, attachment style in reaction to both your mom and your dad. Um, your dad was avoidant, unattuned, and possibly narcissistic, which is going to uh, alter your working models of self and other. Your neurological development is going to be affected, and your mom, who was loving and caring, and you sounds like you have a lot of respect for her and enjoy spending time with her. But when she was nervous, you reacted by shutting down. Now it's possible that you developed a a slight avoidance and reaction to your dad. And then the way your mom was kind of provoked more avoidance for you. Like it's possible that if you had a different father, your mom's nervousness wouldn't have pushed you further into avoidance. Um, but you know, anxious parents, it, that's, um, I don't, it can be abusive, but at the very least it's damaging, uh, to children, which I guess is the definition of abusive. Anyway, the point is, is that anxious, nervous parents are a problem in, um, particularly I think our society there, there's a, given all the news and the sensational, you know, you, you tell parents your child is much safer walking the streets today than they were uh, 20, 40 years ago. Most parents think it is the direct opposite. Most parents think that um, it's dangerous, more dangerous now than it was a generation ago. 
statistics have shown that is not true. Kids are being abducted and killed uh, in the 70s, 80s, uh, frequently, more frequently than they are today. So why is this? Why do parents have a distorted view of reality? Well, it's because of the media. And no one wants to come out and say that your kids are safer now because it's just not one of those ideas that people are attracted to. No, you'll be ostracized. You know, if you're in a group of parents, and you're like, ah, you know, um, I let my kids walk to school a mile each way. A lot of parents are going to judge you. Whereas if you say, I pick up my kids from school, even though they, they go to school two blocks away, um, you're not going to get a lot of judgment. It's just a different cultural shift. And so uh, parents are just, so there's this um, privileging of information that terrifies parents out there. Now, I'm not saying you're, you're supposed to let your kids walk to school. What I'm saying is that we have a society that is causing a lot of anxious parenting. We're, we also have a lot of anxious people. Anxiety, you know, people don't realize often that the most common disorder you can suffer from is, in, is an anxiety disorder. Something like a third of Americans will suffer from a full-blown anxiety disorder at some point in their life. That's much more, that's a much higher prevalence rate than depression or, you know, any of the other things you'll hear people talk about much more often, ADHD. Anxiety is everywhere. Generalized anxiety, panic disorder, um, you know, you could consider OCD uh, an anxiety disorder, um, PTSD you can consider kind of an anxiety disorder, and especially when we start including OCD and PTSD. Now we're talking like, pretty high percentage of people. So there's a lot of parents out there suffering from untreated anxiety, um, maybe low grade generalized anxiety, general worry, worriedness. And as a parent, that's going to affect not only your ability to attune because you're too preoccupied with your own anxiety, but it also gives this message to a child that they have to somehow deal with your anxiety. You know, children, um, they see the world through our eyes as parents. And if we see the world as an anxious, terrifying place, then children will too. And children don't feel good about that, right? Um, children are scared enough as it is. They don't need you to add to it with your own paranoias and your own unreasonable anxiety. And there's a lot of people who have um, mild generalized anxiety who don't recognize they have mild generalized anxiety. You know, I, there are many people with anxiety that I will say, well, you sound like you suffer from some anxiety. They'll be like, no, no, I'm just realistic. You know, there it, it's irrational not to worry about 10 things a day. And, and so there's a, because I think of the way the news is and the way our culture has shifted to I think generally more of an anxious culture. We're just generally more scared, maybe because since 9-11 or I don't know what, but um, politicians injecting things into our head. The Nextdoor app, you know, if you're familiar with Nextdoor, pretty much every post on there is about someone breaking into your house. And uh, if you're just constantly exposed to this idea that there's this army of, you know, people trying to break into your house every day, um, do people break into houses? Yeah. And, you know, do what you need to do. But it's extremely unlikely that it's going to happen on a particular day to you. Um, you know, and there are measures you can take. The point is, is that um, anonymous patron, it's absolutely possible that your avoidant attachment developed in reaction to your mom because you learned. Um, so if I was to take a guess, and this would be something to explore in therapy, is that early in your life, the main frustration to your attunement was your father, and you learned to avoid kind of with him. As you were uh, after the divorce or whatever, your well, let's see, did you did you say your parents got divorced? Anyway, as you are bonding with your mom, you feel mostly good with your mom, and your mom probably mitigated a lot of the attachment and security that your father contributed to. And so your mom is doing good. She's parenting well. She's attuned. She's caring. She, um, but as you say, it's almost like she cares too much. And um, I, you're languaging it as caring too much. What I would call it is anxious caring. That she cares and loves you for sure. But then you're like, it's almost like she cares too much about me. That's motivated likely by anxiety. That... It's not, a, it's not motivated by love. It's motivated by terror of what could happen to you because she cares about you, but she's 
over she's irrationally afraid and thinking about worst case scenarios too often and um you know activated emotionally uh too severely by the normal um fears of life and so um your dad contributed to the beginning of the avoidance and then as your mom exhibited this um, occasional anxiety with you you learned oh it's it's better to i have to save my mom i love my mom I have to save her from her own anxiety. And so I I can't tell her my needs and I don't know what's going to trigger her. So I just generally have to turn everything off. So that would be an hypothesis to pursue in therapy. Okay. This next email is from patron Jackie. She writes, number one, thank you for saying that people with messed up attachments can have secure kids. That made me feel very relieved. Number two, I'm probably avoidant, but I think it might actually have made me well-suited to be an emergency medicine physician because I'm able to block my own anxiety out in really stressful situations. Your podcast also made me more empathetic at work. Sometimes in the ER, we get a little burnt out, and when a patient is yelling at me or being a dick, I might feel a certain way about them, but lately I'm just like, You poor soul, you're insecurely attached. I need to be nicer to you so you know that you can trust your doctors. So thank you for that tool. Number three, I think your public health initiative for making parents watch an instructional video on attachment and parenting sounds amazing. End of email. Well, thanks for that, Jackie. Yeah, uh, being avoidant can help people deal with stressful situations. People with avoidant attachment style tend to be cut off from their emotions or their emotions can be deadened sometimes for reasons that I've discussed. And that can actually be a strength. Um, there's, there's a fair amount of research showing that avoidant attachment has its, its upside. So uh, that's one of them. The other thing you're saying is that you're able to see now with your uh, ER patients who are being dicks that in all likelihood it's stemming from attachment worries and and or if they just feel securely attached to you or or safe with you attachment wise that it'll calm them down and and make them feel safe such that they can regulate themselves so um, i think that's wonderful that you're doing that so very wise and 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 great that you're doing that um also yeah i you know i have a lot of things on my plate the first thing when I have time I want to do is start doing deep dives again, which I hope is in the next month. The other thing after that is I want to start working on that uh, parenting training that will help them attune to their kids. And there are already training. And I don't know what it'll in- entail. Um, I'm guessing what it'll entail based on my gauge of the landscape is that I will develop a funneling of money and effort to those researchers and um, teachers who are already doing this work. Cause you know, this attachment intervention for new parents has been going on for decades. And so I'm guessing it's just a matter of me using my platform to raise money maybe political will to uh, get these kinds of programs more uh, in the spotlight and emphasize the research that's art that's already been done on these kinds of interventions and um, really making it a central effort in our society. You know, there's a lot of things that our society kind of works on and Uh, You know, we're seeing more and more environmentalism being worked on as a society. Uh, We have a long way to go, but um, we're, you know, heading in that direction. And this should be another one. There's so many things that can be solved, as evidence shows, by helping young parents attune to their kids more effectively. All right. This next email is from patron Scott. He says, Do you know of any research that shows a particular type of therapy to be most effective at healing avoidant attachment? End of email. Yeah, there's a fair amount of research, but you know, it's hard to research this sort of thing. And uh, the thing that I would say, Scott, if you're looking for a therapist, 
is I would interview them over the phone or in person about what they would do. You know, like, so say you have avoidant attachment. You're like, okay, therapist, how would I have avoidant attachment? How, do you know what that is? And two, how would you help me to um, change from avoidant to secure attachment? How, how would you do that? If you hear an intelligent response uh, that sounds along the lines of the things that we talk about on this podcast, then I'd give them a shot. And because that could be a CBT therapist, it could be an interpersonal therapist, psychodynamic, humanistic therapist, it could be a gestalt, uh, uh, internal family systems person, it could be an attachment oriented therapist, of course. But any of those labels uh, of therapists could be applied or identified, and they could be bad with this sort of thing. So um, the kind of things you're looking for are, do they know what avoiding attachment is in an in-depth way? Because, you know, a lot, some therapists have this very, I don't know, elementary understanding of avoiding attachment. They usually think of it as something that only applies to kids. And, you know, they've read about it, but they don't really fully get the um, working models and how it affects adults and how pervasive it can be and da da da. Um, so first off, I would I would test the therapist to see if they get it. The second thing is is what the kind of things you want to hear are corrective experiences. Obviously, if you hear that phrase, talking about how you can learn to over, through experience in therapy and by um, you know being more intentional in your uh, relationships outside of therapy, how you can change the way you feel about yourself, the way you feel about others, such that you don't need to avoid because you trust other people and you have a direct line to your needs, you know, a uh, sense of self, you know, those, uh, knowing your vulnerability needs, that'd be another word you want to look for is, you know, does the therapist talk about your vulnerability as the cure, you know, getting in touch with your vulnerability and expressing it and having it being taken care of and just repeating that over and over again. So regardless of the form of therapy that, that they identify with, those are the kinds of things I'd look for. All right. This next email is from patron Allison from Tennessee. She writes, I was listening to your deep dive on attachment and the part where you spoke about working models really stood out to me. You gave the example of an accountant who goes into tax season and might be overly stressed out about it due to a bad working model of themselves and even became and even become a bit histrionic about sharing their feelings with others so others understand their stress. I really identified with that. When I get a new assignment at work, my first thought is immediately, oh no, there is no way I can do this. And I become super stressed out about it and then complain to everyone who will listen about how stressed, at, how stressed I am about it. My dad does the same thing with his work. What confuses me, though, is that I seemingly have no reason to have this working model of myself that is bad. In fact, my parents often tell me that I am smart so that I'm sometimes a, a little bit worried that I think too much of my, that I will think too much of myself because of all their compliments. Whenever I get stressed like this, my mom just sort of brushes it off and says that she knows I'm capable of doing it and I shouldn't worry about it. So why do you think I'd have this working model of myself being incapable at work, even though I always succeed at whatever was stressing me out and everyone tells me I'm capable and how can I go about fixing this in myself? End of email. Well, it's hard to say, um, you know, we just have conceptualizations. We don't have a scientific way of determining the answer to this question, but possible conceptualizations are the first thing that comes to mind is that your parents are kind of blowing you off. They're being nice. You know, they're, they're saying, no, no, you got this. You're good. You'll be fine. Don't worry about it. There's a, um, a message that can be given to you that you don't, your emotions don't really matter. And although it's great that they believe in you and that they compliment you, but the um, experience that you're having in the moment is one of fear. You know, if we just ignore the context and we think of the emotion, you're afraid. You go to your parents and your parents are like, there's nothing to be afraid of. Instead of I'm with you in, in your fear. I understand your fear. I, I see your fear. I'm, I mirror your fear. I 
recognize that you're afraid. And I'm not trying to solve it by just telling you everything's going to be okay. I mean, you even say, um, whenever I get stressed like this, my mom just sort of brushes it off. Well, that sounds like you're being brushed off in a, in a nice way, a polite way, but you're still being brushed off. Attunement isn't reassuring someone. Attunement is being a pro, is noticing someone's emotional state and reacting in a way that makes them feel safe. So when you are afraid and you're like, oh crap, I have this thing that I have to do at work and, and I, I don't know if I'm gonna succeed, and you run to your parents because they're your secure base. Um, and the fact that they're brushing you off with everything's going to be fine, that doesn't really attune to your emotion. So you're emotionally feeling abandoned and unsafe and unattuned to, unseen, unheard, un, um, cared for, unheld. And I don't know this to be true, but that would be one hypothesis to consider. The other thing is that it could just be a way that you have learned to seek attunement. I, it's possible that when you feel lack of attunement or lack of closeness, lack of attachment security, you engage in this subconscious motivation to freak out at work because you know that it'll motivate you to seek attunement. Because you learn this from your dad. Your dad does this. And it's possible that your dad's way of uh, seeking closeness is to drum up anxiety about work so that it'll provoke him to reach out to other people and then other people will care for him. That's another possibility. But, you know, there are many others. And of course, I would explore it with a therapist. All right. This next email is from patron Sophie from Norway. She asks or writes in, I've struggled with preoccupied attachment my entire life, which only worsened after my ex unexpectedly left me, left me three year, after three years. A year later, I'm in a new relationship, but I struggle with fear of abandonment from him. I've repeatedly told him that words of affirmation and verbal reassurance make me feel safe. Whenever he doesn't do this for me, I feel unsafe, unwanted, and ultimately spiral to the point where I want to break up with him. But he does not speak my love language of words of affirmation. And while he says that he tries to, it is as if he doesn't understand what I truly need from him. This leaves me confused as to whether it is I who demand too much from him, and this is only my preoccupied attachment trauma, or whether my genuine needs in a relationship are being unmet. End of email. Yeah, this is a conundrum and difficult to know. There's almost no way to know the answer to that question because it could be either or both, that your reactivity to him is 100% unfair, meaning that he's doing, you know, a good enough job and you're just transferring, displacing onto him and distorting reality to fit your feeling, which is a feeling of abandonment or, and, or he isn't very good at attuning and is it, or at the very least, isn't, um, compatible with you. And if you had, you know, overnight suddenly healed your preoccupied attachment, you would find that he's just not the right one for you because he just isn't, you know, he's, he's made for someone else, but it's not you. Um, and it's hard to tell, you know, uh, it could be, I mean, we definitely know your preoccupation is a factor. What we don't know is, is compatibility also a factor. Um, so, you know, you definitely want to work in therapy on your preoccupied attachment. Um, and over time that should be, uh, answerable, but you know, this is a tough one. And I've worked with clients on this many times. And sometimes it'll take five, 10 years to suss it out. And at the end of the time, you're like, yeah, I think, you know, I've healed from my, you know, say you go to therapy, Sophie, for the next 10 years, and you slowly go through corrective experiences, have earned security, and you're still with this guy in 10 years. And at the end of that process, you know, you're 90% recovered from your preoccupied attachment. And then you're like, you know what? I don't think this guy has ever been compatible for me. I think I'm going to break up with him. <laughs> you know, that can happen. Uh, or another story is you go to therapy for 10 years and you slowly recover from preoccupied trauma and you have, you have a string of relationships that all end partially due to your preoccupied attachment. And 
you look back at all those relationships and say, they all were compatible with me, but I ruined it with my preoccupied attachment. You know, that's not uncommon as well, but it's not your fault. You understand because your preoccupied attachment developed as a result of terrible parenting, essentially. So, um, you know, the key is, is recover from your preoccupied attachment and just do your best and, you know, uh, muddle your way through uh, your romantic attachments. The key is, is to get your needs met, right? So that can be done through romantic relationships or friendships or therapy relationships or, you know, family members. Know your needs. You have a need for secure attachment. And um, sometimes romantic attachments aren't the best way to seek that. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it's just one of the types of relationships. Um, the other thing is, is just allow yourself to have some of these ambiguities, you know, uh, attachment insecurity, we all have it to some extent, and you just have to say, well, you know, I, I'm doing the best I can. Um, the other thing obviously is going to couples therapy, because that, that's a wonderful way to answer this question. As a couples therapist, you know, I'll have a preoccupied person come into my office with their spouse, and I will absolutely, as an attachment-oriented therapist, will investigate this question, you know, is if the two of you came into my office, I would spend a fair amount of time trying to figure out, is he doing something to frustrate her preoccupied attachment? Or is he doing everything that he can do um, within reason? And we really need to focus on her preoccupied attachment. I would absolutely be asking that question to myself, because that's pretty important to, to know. We obviously have preoccupied attachment that we want to focus on, but do we have something in him? At the, the very least, there's things that he could do that would help, right? Um, and it sounds like he wants to help and maybe couples therapy, I'm sure, actually. Well, I can't be sure, but I'm fairly sure that couples therapy would help him to develop ways to help you with that. Okay, this next email is from an anonymous patron in Australia. She writes, how do you treat potentially emerging personality disorders in children? I recognize that personality disorders are not diagnosed in children, but I've come across a few children in therapy setting who show all the hallmarks of a budding personality disorder, including outwardly genial, but constantly grandiose and manipulative lying, lack of empathy, history of attachment trauma, mood, affect, incongruence, or when asked, changing their affect and reported mood on a dime to manipulate others, including adults, etc. In the past, I struggled to find much information on these symptoms or how to treat such emerging behaviors. Do you have much insight on how you might approach or treat such a client? It can be hard to not feel helpless sometimes when you see a child in such a situation, sometimes only for a short period, and recognize that what the parent sees as it's fine, he's just a kid, will likely become an issue for them down the line and potentially many others who encounter them. End of email. Yeah. I think what you're describing is emerging narcissism. It's hard to know, but um, certainly narcissism isn't something that one develops at the age of 18. It's something that develops at the age of one to three years old. And you can see a five-year-old or a 10-year-old who absolutely seems to have that um, early uh, personality uh, disorder, but hard to know. Certainly a lot of kids can be 10 years old and exhibit what looks like narcissistic personality disorder. And then later on, they quote unquote grow out of it or change or something. But so you're saying, you know, how do you treat it? Well, the first thing is, is addressing what you're saying is the helplessness that you feel. I mean, treating an adult with narcissistic personality disorder is, can feel helpless at times. So treating a kid. Um, the other thing is, is in order to, for me to treat adults with narcissistic personality disorder or any personality disorder for that matter. It requires the client to understand that they have a personality disorder. And that is, uh, you know, in the initial phase of therapy, that's what I'm working on. I'm, I'm trying to help them understand that they have relational traumas and schemas that are resulting in a massive distortion of self and others that is causing emotional problems and relationship problems. And to try to get someone with a personality disorder to see that there's something quote unquote wrong with them or different about them is very hard to do because uh, one, the traits that they exhibit are ingrained in their personality. It's neurological. It's not uh, something like anxiety that can feel like it comes from the outside, but 
They also have massive working model problems, attachment wise, and distrust other people or hate themselves or something. And so it's really hard for them to have any kind of discussion around their shortcomings. The other thing is, is that they often lack a sense of who they are. And so they don't even know their emotions. And so a lot of self-discovery occurs when you notice your own emotional state, you notice your own needs. And because of their relational traumas, they, they don't have a connection with that. So there, there's a lot of barriers, but it can be done and, and, it, and it is done. Um, but with kids, it's even harder because kids, in, you know, by definition, are less aware of themselves. They're generally um, less interested in talking about themselves or about these kinds of things. They're more fragile in terms of their ego. Um, they're often not coming to therapy voluntarily. So, uh, yeah. And as you say, some of these kids you only see for a short period of time. Uh, so what are you going to do? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> narcissistic personality disorder takes 10, 20 years to treat. Uh, if you're only seeing them for a couple months, yeah, there, there's, there's literally nothing you do. So <clears throat> the thing that I um, will tell my trainees is when we enter this field, we're given this impression that we can save the world. You know, we're given the tools and the knowledge and the ability and the venue to, to really help people. And it, that tends to be kind of generalized and smeared out over all clients when it really only applies to some clients with some issues. You know, it's sort of like if someone has like 10 cavities and a dentist um, is only allowed to see the patient for like seven minutes, then the dentist will say, well, I see 10 cavities. There could be more, but this is like several appointments worth of treatment. The dentist doesn't say, well, it's my responsibility to, to treat these 10 cavities in seven minutes. The dentist says, I just don't have the time. And, or you have a patient who refuses to let you drill, you know, it's like, well, you can look in my mouth, but you can't, you can't give me Novocaine. You can't drill. You can't, you can't treat. And the dentist is like, well, I see the cavities and I've told you what needs to be done, but you're not willing to let me do it. So I can't help you. But somehow therapists don't really apply that scrutiny to their clientele and their situations. Um, I think there's a number of factors. One is, is that there's just lack of of education supervision re regarding discerning which clients are actually helpable. Um, but I also, you know, a lot of therapists um, are self-sacrificing and think that it's sort of their responsibility to save the world. And I will disabuse my trainees of this uh, gladly. <laughs> and I often, you know, make a pointed effort to do it. Just like especially when they run into situations like this, where it's like, I see this problem and how do I treat it? You know, how do I feel insufficient? I feel like I'm not doing a good enough job. And, and so we spent a lot of time um, understanding the landscape that it's not you, it's them and it's the system or the situation. And I never really am effective <laughs> with my trainees, you know, I, I feel like I could get them about 50% of the way there, but I think over time it might take 10, 20, 30 years as a therapist to, to fully kind of get it. It certainly was that way for me that there are just some situations that there's just nothing you could do. And that powerless feeling is um, there's a lot of grief that happens from that. And, and you have to go through that grieving process that you're going to witness problems, maybe even personality disorders, and see the train wreck that will happen throughout that person's life in the future and everyone around them. And there's nothing you can do. Now, what can you do? Well, what I always resorted to, and this was after years of running into situations like this, is I worked with the parents extensively because there, there's this model of like, well, you know, this kid has a problem. So obviously you're going to isolate the kid and try to fix it. You know, it's like, the kid has cancer. Well, you don't want to bring the parents in. You got to bring that kid in. You got to give them cancer treatment. Well, 
um, this thinking is um, flawed because the parents, the caregivers are the main therapist for that child. You know, we don't usually think about it that way, but the person, the people who have the most emotional effect on a child are the parents. The therapist will never even come close to the amount of effect. In fact, uh, eventually I got to a point years into my practice that pretty much all the time, um, I, you know, the parents would bring the kid in and I would see the kid in my office one-on-one, maybe family therapy, but I would see the kid one-on-one occasionally, but kind of as a way to placate the parents. Cause I really, I would need to be talking with the parents because there were things that I could do with the kid for sure, but there was so much more I could do helping the parents essentially parent in a therapeutic way to the kid. The parents are there 24 seven. And there's so much involvement between children and their parents, particularly, you know, um, you know, kids that are pre 13, there's a, a lot of involvement between kids and their parents. And so there's just so much a parent can do. Um, so that's what I would do. An honest patron from Australia is if I saw narcissism budding in a child and I only had, you know, three to six months with this family, I would be, I would be spending a lot of time with the parents. Like, here's what I'm observing. Here's what needs to be done. Here's the treatment things. Here are things you could do as a parent. Here are how it, here's how it developed. Here's how it's going to become unraveled with your help. Um, Here's what you need to, uh, you need to lower your expectations around this. You need to raise your expectations. You know, there's so many things attitudinally and behaviorally and, knowledge wise that a parent can um, do to set them up for at least better trajectories into the future. All right. This next email anonymous patron. He writes, is it worth the effort in dating someone who doesn't believe in love? I accidentally dated two adult children of divorce and both seemed to have avoidant attachment with the second person, we seemed to have a connection at first, but after a month, I see she is also drifting away gradually because I have to chase her all the time. I have insecure attachment, but I see if I do not initiate a talk, she might not write to me. She once said she never expects to get married. How can I show that I am looking for a simple relationship? Well, the more I pursued, I am getting more frustrated and gradually I am thinking of giving up. End of email. Yeah. So you say you have insecure attachment. It sounds like maybe preoccupied. I don't know. Um, it's possible that your partners have avoidant attachment. It's also possible that you are just seeing avoidance when they're just um, reacting to your preoccupation. It's also possible that it's just the beginning of a relationship. I mean, you say that uh, it's it's a month into the relationship. I mean, um, it's hard to know what's happening a month into a relationship. It could just be that they're just not into you and not avoidant. Um, you're connecting it to children of divorce, and you know that could be a factor. But a lot of kids are children of divorce, and so it's just hard to generalize like that. But what it sounds to be like you recognize you have preoccupied attachment. And you recognize that you pursue often and um, you're starting to go down a cognitive road that frankly, a lot of preoccupied men go down these days. It's, it's sort of a incel route that says like all these, you know, women, they just, they don't want to uh, put the effort into a relationship. You know, like the nature in, in your first question is, is it worth the effort in dating someone who doesn't believe in love? Um, that's quite a statement. You know, you've really convinced yourself that she doesn't believe in love. Why do you say that? I mean, that that's a, it's kind of an aggressive statement to say that about her. One, it's possible she's just not into you, which I recognize sucks and that hurts and that's okay that it hurts. But to extend that hurt into making a sense of, essentially accusations about her is unfair. The other possibility is that she is avoidant. Um, the other possibility is that she's secure, but she just seems avoidant because you're preoccupied. But, you know, the, the way that you're wording a lot of these things, you know, children of divorce, um, and doesn't believe in love and, um, 
how you say, how can I show her that I'm just looking for a simple relationship? Um, there's a lot of preoccupied distortions in your question, and there's a lot of assumptions based in, you know, ba baked into your questions. And, and there also is some aggressiveness in there and maybe even some male entitlement. I don't know, but the key is, is that you're able to re recover from your preoccupied attachment in therapy. The second thing is, is as you're in therapy recovering, um, earning some security, you're able to sift through your relationships and you can get some feedback from your therapist on your distortions and your displacements uh, and your transferences uh, that are happening. It's, it's likely, given the wording of your email, that you're distorting what other people are doing and what they're thinking and who even who they are. I understand you're hurt and it makes total sense that you're hurt. Preoccupied people are almost in a constant state of being hurt. So that you can, um, that I will validate and that I will be with you about. To make judgments about other people, to uh, make this or to have this attitude like it's their fault that you're feeling preoccupied. I, I don't know if I'm going to go with you on that one. So um, get the help you need, get the support that you deserve. All right, this next email is from Crystal from Texas. She writes, does sleep training, does sleep training harm attachment? As a mother of two small children, two years old and one month old, the subject of sleep is something I think about at least once a day. I've done my research, but the prescribed approaches always felt too harsh to me. But now with a newborn and my inability to clone myself, LOL, I'm faced with the reality of I can't be in two places at once. And sometimes one of my children will, cr will cry while I'm tending to the other. My toddler is having a really hard time with the change and is downright distressed if I try to leave the room to nap time with the other in particular. My question is, how worried should I be about mildly traumatizing her? Is talking about what will happen and being there to wake up her repair, is talking about what will happen and being there to wake her up repair enough? I don't want her to feel betrayed and abandoned. End of email. Yeah, a lot here. Um, hard to answer this question. So I will say one thing is, is that it's normal for a toddler who has a younger sibling to go through some difficulty. So without it being traumatic or injuring to the child, it's almost a good thing that you have a, that your toddler is protesting because your, your toddler loves you, is attached to you and is um, not having access to you as much anymore at a young age. And so it, it's, it's a, if I didn't, if, if you didn't have a toddler that was upset, if your toddler wasn't upset, your two-year-old wasn't upset, I would be worried about that. So just kind of, you know, recognize that it's actually a good thing that um, your toddler's having a hard time. The other thing is that, um, uh, what else could I say? Uh, I can't know the answer to the question, obviously. I'd, I'd have to be there, and it's a matter of trial and error, and parenting is messy. The The first thought I had was, where are the other caregivers? Because if you are the only person taking care of these two uh, children, one month old and two years old, uh, that is not doable. <laughs> like, you know, the it takes a village thing. Like, it's, it's real. So uh, where are other people? Um, there should at least be one other person, if not five other people there to entertain the toddler or to be with the toddler while you are spending so much time with your with your one month old child. Um, so there's that. The other th thing here is you're saying, you know, can sleep training harm attachment? Yeah, if it's done poorly. And the things that you will see online are fine and, you know, take it into consideration, but every child is different. Every parent is different. So you cannot apply anything in parenting as a, uh, as a universal approach to children. Every child is different. Every moment is different. Children go through different phases. And so it's the, it, it's always a matter of, um, balancing, compromising, you know, cause on one hand, your child wants you there all the time. On the other hand, you can't always be there all the time. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, how do you balance all that out? 
Um, it also could just be a phase that your toddler is going through that the, the kid that, you know, the younger sibling is one month. So maybe after a few other months, your toddler will, will just adjust, you know, maybe it's just a matter of like, wait, so I can be usurped by even a younger sibling. Like I didn't know that could happen. It, it can it just, just take some time. Um, like I said, I would hope that there are other people that your toddler can go to when you're taking care of the one, one month old. Uh, if that's not the case, um, I would try to cultivate that, uh, either an extended family, I don't know, maybe a nanny, uh, something, uh, distractions. Now you're saying that you're trying to get the toddler to do nap time so that you could maybe spend more time with the one month old. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know how to, uh, you're saying is talking about what will happen and being there to wake her up, repair her enough. Yeah. You know, talking to a toddler and saying, I love you. I'll be, you know, I'm putting you. I, so if I'm, re, I, you didn't give a lot of detail, but what I think is happening, Crystal, is that you're putting the toddler down for nap and, and you're leaving the child in the room by themselves because it'll give you an hour so you can actually maybe get some stuff done and or take care of the one month old child. And <clears throat> so you're saying to the child, I will be right in the other room and I will be here when you wake up. And you're finding that your toddler is freaking out when they wake up or when they figure out they're alone or something. And yeah, I, you know, I could give you some guidelines, but I'm sure you've heard them all. It, it's just tough. It, if you're doing this by yourself and there's no one else to help you or it's inconsistent help or something, um, you know, it, it, there's, there's only so much you can do. You're, you're only one person and you're like, am I mildly traumatizing her? Yeah. I, the, the other thing I say is the best you can do as a parent is, is only traumatize them enough such that they only need five to 10 years of therapy once they move out of your house. And I don't say that as a joke. Uh, every, the best parent on the planet mildly traumatizes their children. <laughs> like the example that I always give, I always think about is, well, there's two examples. One is his bedtime. The other one is like, they want a cookie. So I'll just, I'll just keep to, they want a cookie. So you, you've all experienced this before. Um, there's something that your child wants you know, either a toy from the store or they want to stay up later or they want to, you know, touch that thing they're not supposed to touch or they, they want an extra cookie or, a, you know, something. There's something that they want and you can either give it to them or not give it to them. And for various, you know, legitimate reasons, you don't give it to them because of, you know, safety or too many, too much sugar or something. The children they take it hard. <laughs> like it, it feels like you hate them in that moment and they hate you in that moment. That's a rough moment. It's a normal moment, but it can be mildly traumatizing at best, you know? And so uh, we tend to look at those as, ah, you know, it's normal life to the kid. It is devastating sometimes. And there's just no way around that because you can't give kids everything that they want. There has to be some level of frustration. And so, there's some level of, I cannot depend on my parents or I'm not good enough to get this thing. And so the, the task isn't to not mildly traumatize your child. The, the, the task is to minimize the mild trauma as best you can <laughs> or mitigate it or m try to make up for it kind of, but never really get there. You know, there's not a single kid that doesn't have an insecurity. All kids have insecurity. So there isn't a single kid that doesn't have some kind of trust issue. There isn't a single adult that doesn't have some sort of trust trust issue. So, um, yeah, <laughs> that's what I'll say to that one. This next email, anonymous listener, they write in, can breath holding spells as a child be a culprit of my insecure attachment style? I had chronic breath holding spells as a toddler what do you think about breath holding spells and it's possibly being linked to insecure attachment? End of email. Yeah, uh, it's hard to know. Breath holding spells are a bit of a mystery um, if we don't have other kinds of conceptualizations like 
um, you know, trauma or something that could explain it. Some kids just develop it and we don't have a firm causation uh, link, but uh, it appears that some kids either develop it just out of fun. It, it's a, it's a thing of control for them. It's like, look, I can do this. And also look, I can control people around me by freaking them out. It's, that's kind of fun. You know, kids go through phases like that. They will be at the high chair eating food and they just like th throwing all their food and their plates and their utensils on the ground and hearing it smashed. You know, it's just kind of fun. <laughs> it's like, look what I can do. Look what I can do. I can hold my breath and everyone freaks out. Um, but it could be a result of insecure attachment that the child feels like they need to hold their breath in order to get attention or they hold their breath as a way of punishing the caregivers for not um, giving them enough attention and love and security. Yeah, you know, it's hard to know, but uh, obviously I would explore it with a therapist if you're concerned. All right, well, I, I th I've i only got one more email and I managed to get through all the attachment emails today, even though this is kind of a long episode. It's always very satisfying to me to be able to complete something. Like I'm a, I'm a, a list crosser after. <laughs> it always feels good to... And I always have your emails hanging over my head, particularly you up to your Patreon emails. It's always like, okay, got to get to those. And so I've, I've gotten to almost all of them at this point. Um, anonymous listener wrote in and said, can attachment styles shift in the direction of insecurity based on adult experiences? Uh, the answer is, yeah, absolutely. Uh, anything can cause you to uh, generally change your working model of self and other, and thus your defenses thereof. Uh, could someone with an anxious attachment not only give up for a while on relationships, but actually become avoidant after suffering a lengthy period of neglect or abandonment? End of question. So um, the answer is yes. One can shift from preoccupied to avoidant or have qualities of both. But I get this question a lot. And usually what I find when I talk to the individual is because uh, they'll say like, well, normally I'm preoccupied, but sometimes I'm totally avoidant. Usually what that, uh, what we'll find, not always, is that I would conceptualize them primarily as, and maybe solely as preoccupied. And sometimes things get just so bad for them that they will just stop engaging in close relationships or romantic relationships. But that doesn't mean they're avoidant. That just means they're going through a phase of preoccupation that involves not engaging in relationships. You could call that avoiding relationships, but their emotional and attachment reactivity is still that of a preoccupied person, if that makes sense. Um, the other question here is, is the change in attachment less fixed and more open to corrective experiences as an adult because it happened later in life? Um, yeah, generally speaking, if you had secure attachment as a child, and then at the age of 25, went through a difficult relationship and thus developed some attachment insecurity and went to therapy, it, you, in my estimation you, or prediction, wouldn't usually take as long to heal from that because you have a foundation of secure attachment from early childhood, for sure. Um, so that's that question. All right, well, I think I combed through all of my all the emails from me all about attachment. Um, and uh, tune in next time when I do something else on this podcast. <laughs> and everyone else. And everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do. Mm -hmm.